Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to Leading Our Own Way. We're up to part three of this week's episode of the show. We're diving even deeper into our conversation with this week's guest. Let's continue exploring their inspiring journey. If you've missed part one and two, definitely go back and catch up. Also, if you're not subscribing, please, please subscribe. Enjoy the rest of the show. See you soon. And sometimes her voice is what really got me through, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> when it was really difficult. And that person does probably, and that's the problem with teaching, isn't it? Unfortunately, we don't know yeah. what they remember. Um, and so that person won't even know how much of an influence she was, that voice speaking in your ears of, of you can go to college with a disability. And that's a powerful message we hopefully can spread just on this yes. podcast alone. Um, so I was going to ask you, actually, was there anyone at school? in the school system, but I think you've answered it. Well, is, I mean, was there, apart from the student teacher, was there anybody else? I was also blessed whenever I was really struggling in high school, I found an art group that was right outside of our school district. And there were some people that were really encouraging to me in that. And I could shed that reputation of being the outcast was really important. I also was really lucky once I stopped hanging out with them that I found an adult writing group. And these are people that 20 years later, we still meet once a month to talk about our writing. And they got to see me grow as a writer and a person. And they encouraged me to write about having a learning disability. And I said, oh, no, that's too personal. And I put it on the shelf for so many years. And when I finally got that courage to write about it, I'm so glad that I listened to them because uh, that is what started a lot of my writing. And there was also a woman that could see in, the, in that writing group my my photography and the perspective that I had. I went to prom and at the venue there was a picture of this tree and I took a picture of it and all my peers were saying, why did you take a picture of a tree? And that woman looked at that picture and she goes, here, this shows that you have perspective. And I put that on the shelf for a number of years and thought, oh, I'm not a photographer. I'm not good at anything like that. And then I took a picture of an angel at a cemetery years later. And I had a friend that saw that and she said, this is really good. And when I entered it into a show, I got an honorable mention. Wow. Do you still do photography today then? I, I do. I take pictures of flowers when I'm on my walks and I place them on my blog. I've had them published before. I, I might as well get this out whilst we're here. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Yes. That is one of my favorites. I, uh, we were visiting family in New England uh, that fall and we went to the Yankee Candle Factory Yeah, and they always do such a really nice spread, uh, a nice uh, decorative thing. So yeah, that, that is me in front of there with all the pumpkins and the flowers. My husband took that. Well, I'm showing pictures of Michelle for whoever's watching, uh, listening on Spotify and Apple, but um, uh, I can tell why you like flowers because I've got two of them in here <laughs> in the studio. A fall flower show. Yeah, yeah nice. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's really I, I like that. That's cool. So you you should sounds like you should do um a little bit more photography by the sounds of it. To be honest, I would love to definitely. And, and we will get into the writing a little bit later on. I'm fascinated, and anything that you do share, we can put in the show notes. Or if there's anything I can put on display here, because I have a, quite a lot of my guest books who have written books up on here mm -hmm. as well, um next to mine here but <laughs> not here to plug that one, but there we go. Um, so do you, I had a question then about the system, the school system, and I forgot what it was. I've kind of gone blank. The, um, hmm, no, I forgot what it was. It was about, it was leading off from your student teacher and then your, the groups. It was a good question as well. <laughs> I don't mind making mistakes here yes. in this show. Don't worry. I won't edit this out. I want it to be real and authentic. So that's okay. It, it will come it to me. Yeah, no, it yeah. will come to me. It was a good, it felt like it was a powerful question as well. Your perspective. Oh, that was kind of the line. You said your parents took you into school. It's still expecting you to build your resilience and your human skills and being able to cope mm -hmm. in the world. I'm really big on that. I feel like the education system since I've started has kind of changed and, and parenting's changed where we give answers quickly. We don't, we don't, we don't put the children in uncomfortable positions and I don't mean them for, to feel horrible and shit about themselves, but in the sense of building up the resilience and building up the mindset to be able to go, well, I know they don't think of this, but you know, they don't do spelling tests anymore. We're speaking about this today because 
kids get nervous and scared. But one of the teachers at the schools that I go, go to, uh, mm-hmm. they're not really, it's not in their planner to do spelling tests, but she does it. And I think it's amazing because she wants them to learn what they've learned over the last few weeks. And it's okay to get it wrong and to build up, well, have a better, basically have a better relationship with no and a better relationship with failing. And because failing isn't failing. It's only failing if you don't keep going. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, please. Fact, if you've got anything to say about that. that... Sure. We do a uh, spelling test. Well, I mean, when they go into seventh grade, some, most of our teachers do spelling tests yeah. and we get the words and some of them aren't familiar with the words. And we tell them, please do not look in the dictionary when you write sentences to copy them. We would much, please do, that's plagiarism and you will get in trouble. We would much rather have a student have a word and not know how to use it and try putting it in a sentence than copying another sentence because we're, we're happy if they, I mean, it, if they if they don't know how to use it, we're happy to explain what that word means to them. Yeah. And it's it's one of those things. Sometimes you are going to have to fail. Sometimes you are going to have to not always get everything right away. I mm. I know somebody that throughout her life, it, it was um, I didn't know her very much when she was young, but she was uh, I I think she got a lot of things where people didn't let her fail, or she got a lot of the answers. And then whenever she, she didn't know how to deal with failure whenever she went into college and she struggled and this person just does not have maybe the job that she wants or the, the life because every time she goes, well, I don't know how you can stand failing. She goes, if I fail once at something, then that means that I can't do it again. And I'm thinking I've had to fail with a lot of different things in my life mm. and it's learning from those mistakes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I, but, you know, I, I even still think neurotypical, and I'm using that word because you used mm-hmm. it and I really, I do kind of like it. But neurotypical uh, people, I think, struggle with failing and, and, the, and the relationship with no and connection. And, and right. I, it, maybe that is because of what we have in the world now. You know, I, we always use the example here at, at home. You know, p- children can watch TV and their favorite show at any time of the day, at any point mm-hmm. of their desire. Whereas back in the day, m- me and you, if we wanted to watch Friends, we had to be in a, a certain time uh, yeah. to watch it. And if we missed it, we might have a rerun. But if we don't, we've missed it and we have to go to the next episode and hopefully we'll catch it in the future, you know. Uh, that delay, yeah. gra- those little things, those internal skills that we build up as delayed gratification or not having everything there when we want it and desire it, you know, it is a massive learning um, curve within itself, isn't it? And I feel like we don't do that so much anymore. Whether you're neurotypical or neurodiverse, I think it's important that we cater these kids' needs to be ready for the big wide world because one day they're not going to get a job, right? exactly one day they're they're not going to be successful and mom and dad can't be there to uh support to do that i've known other people too that might be a little bit younger than i am and their parent their their parents are the ones that they handle all their issues and the and the the person just does not know how to handle when life throws them a few curveballs i mean my parents are still supportive of me but I have to be the one that handles a lot of this. Yeah. And when you said about, oh, yeah, kids can watch whatever they wanted all that time. During that time, I grew up in a in an area where we didn't have cable oh, for well, yeah, yeah. until I was in yeah until I was in high school. That for some for uh, there was a thing where they wouldn't put it into uh, the neighborhood that I lived in. And realistically, I don't know if my family could have afforded that growing up when I was very young. But what that ended up doing was I had limited channels. So I had to learn how to entertain my, and I was an only child for 13 years. So I had to learn how to entertain myself. Mm -hmm. I can remember when my family and I moved into our home that my dad built, we didn't have a lot of money and I had a play toaster, but I didn't have play food. So I cut up cardboard and pretended that was toast and put it in the, in the toaster. I wouldn't happen these days. Yeah, it wouldn't happen now. But that's what I had to do because I didn't have a lot of that. I mean, I was blessed. I mean, my family did eventually, you know, got a lot better off and I did have toys and things. So I I didn't laugh for a lot, but it was, but there were some things that just, I maybe didn't happen. And 
I learned how to do that. And I also had to learn to play by myself because I didn't have a sibling. And some of the neighborhood kids that I did play with weren't very nice. So it was, I thought, okay, I'm, I'm happier just sometimes to, to be in my own little world for, for a little bit. Yeah. And I also learned to love to read too. That was a big thing. My dad read to me stories every night and I just learned to love books and would read independently. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Reading is a great brain exercise, isn't it? I, I say that to the children every day, you know, even, even if you not, don't like reading necessarily, it's so powerful for the brain. Uh, I've realized only that, only that in recent years, and I've been a teacher for quite a long time, but I've realized it as a beneficial, in, you know, independent clause for myself, yeah. you know? Um, yeah, there's a, there's a couple of children, there's children everywhere that go, but you know, I think we, um, there's a lot of children that are getting up constantly asking the very basic of simple questions. And I always kind of put it back onto them in a nice way and say, well, what do you think? And more often than not, mm -hmm. they actually know the answer. I'm going, well, there you go. You, you didn't even need to come <laughs> up and ask me that question. You have faith in yourself, have confidence in yourself. And because I've turned my life into a casual role where I go to many, many, many different schools, I don't work at one particular school. Um, I have a lot of children coming up to me when they don't know me and say, Oh, just so you know, Mr. White, I am, uh, I have autism or I have ADHD. I'll go. So don't let it define you. It's okay. It's not a problem. And it doesn't have to be a problem, but don't let it define you. Thanks for making me right. aware, but they're saying it to me as if I've, they've been trained that the person who they're with has to treat them differently. I, I can have, I can be aware and have my own mm -hmm. understanding of the boundaries that I need to place, but. I don't want the child to think they should be treated differently because therefore they're going to act differently. Uh, again, right. I'm okay with them acting differently, but I want them to act them authentic self, not their, the persona that they believe they've got and the labeling that they believe they've got because they've been drilled into their heads, whether it's at home, whether it's by their teachers or whoever mm -hmm. it may be, you are different. So therefore you have to act differently. And, um, yeah, I just, I struggle with that side. What, what, how would you, going back to your primary school, how would you have liked, maybe people don't ask this question often, no, how would you have liked to have been treated with the understanding that you have now of your brain? What I'd love to have been treated with is more of what is going to work for you. Because I think a lot of times when I was in school, I was telling people, I can't do this. And a lot of people weren't really understanding that. So mm -hmm. I think I, uh, there would be things that I would probably say, okay, let's try this. And if it doesn't work, let's get on to something else a lot quicker. If you're writing and your handwriting isn't that amazing, okay, let's, get, let's teach you how to use a computer early. Let's teach you how to learn how to type. Yeah. If you can't read uh, an analog clock, all right, well, let's... Let's get you on uh, a digital one. And I think if it was more customized to things that I, um, that I could do, I would have probably felt a lot more empowered and maybe listened to. Because I can remember they tried one day to put me in uh, regular ed math for reading Roman numerals. or And I think it was also, yeah, and I told them, I said, I can't do this. I don't understand what these mean. Oh, we just want to give you exposure to it. Well, th that's fine. But even today, uh, if you, uh, you get a Roman numeral, I'm like, okay, I have no idea what this means. Doing outlines for years was really hard. Mm -hmm. And I can also remember, too, there was a lot of people that were great with math in my learning support class. And one day we were all in our regular fifth grade classroom and we were doing math facts. And everybody got stickers when they got a lot right. And I can just remember feeling defeated when I didn't get the sticker. And it wasn't bad that people who got the the sticker uh, that were getting math facts correct, that wasn't a bad thing. It was, I was placed in a situation where I wasn't going to be able to win. And I'm not into participation trophies, but I had to be forced into some, you know, an activity or a game that I knew I wasn't going to be successful at. And if you keep placing me in those situations, then I'm going to feel defeated. But if I focus, I've found in my life, if I focus on what I can do and what I enjoy doing, I feel so much more empowered. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And there's an example of being maybe a lack of knowledge and a lack of training and a lack of awareness mm-hmm. of what could be. I'm not saying it's necessarily that individual's fault because they've been in a way programmed right. through their training, their own beliefs, mm-hmm. their own upbringing, maybe their experience as a teacher as well. Uh, they might right. never have been a, across uh, a child or a group of children with ni- ni- neurodiverse capabilities or I don't know what I'm trying to learn what the right terminology is. Um, right. But you know where I'm coming from, right? Yes. And, and okay. outside of that lack of all of that, there's too much for teachers to do. So that even if they did have that knowledge and that training, there's being jammed by the department and everything that's coming mm-hmm. down. And I don't know what it's like in the States. I can only speak for here and, and I know of England where I'm from. But they, they're so burnt out. They don't have the mental capacity to even let that space enter their heads, which right. isn't fair, right? Exactly. A lot of them aren't aware. Some of them don't have that understanding what that's like to be the the, the person with a disability uh, th- that's in their classroom. And I think encouragement, too. I think that was something that I, I really just all throughout the years, I can remember I had a learning support teacher when I said I wanted to go to college. She told me, well, I don't think you can do that because of your disability. Oh, good. And I, that that was really difficult to hear because I was already afraid. I, I think I had a lot of concerns, but I knew I had that desire. Mm-hmm. And I even had a psychiatrist who told me that, uh, that I wouldn't go beyond community college. So I think sometimes I what I really wish I could see in the education system is a more customized approach to the individual that comes in there. Not just, okay, we're going to give you a diagnosis, we're going to give you these accommodations, but I would love to see just a more customized approach to how somebody learns. I'd love to see it on what somebody can do, and I would really love to see a lot of it as, okay, what are we going to do afterwards, especially with our systems that can't, that have adults, because there's very few things that are out there, and the ones that they do have, there's a lot of room for improvement for uh doing a customized approach Mm. yeah absolutely very interesting i think you've just with the word encouragement what you said before goes probably a layer above that i think for anyone that doesn't have an understanding of the brain or doesn't have an understanding Mm -hmm. of what's what type of what people go through on a personal level for example what you were experiencing as a child Connection and relationship has to be the number one point of call, doesn't it? You, you don't have to know everything about every disability, but if you have right. the ability to connect and really dig deep and just have a, re- a really deep relationship, again, take away a percentage of the curriculum so teachers and individuals and humans can have a time to connect with the, the people they're taking care of on every day. The picture gets painted for them, even if they don't have the academic knowledge of right. Would you, would you agree or? I, I agree. I think sometimes you have to really connect with students and get that rapport with them. And I think yeah. that is such a unique thing that I get to do at my job because yeah. it's like hearing a recording of myself at that age. I work a lot with middle school kids and I'll hear, oh, I hate having my learning disability. It makes me stupid or I hate my individual education plan. And I get a chance to go and say, well, you're not dumb. Your brain mm-hmm. is wired differently. And having an uh, an individual education plan is not a bad thing. Having a disability isn't a bad thing. And I really wished in my life I could have had that voice because I didn't know anybody that uh, had a disability like mine. Mostly everybody else that had a disability in my class um, was, you know, just they, they struggle with reading or they struggle with behavior issues. A lot of the, the books were written by men uh, uh, that were in college and all of them struggled with reading or had dyslexia. So I kind of really felt alone. I didn't feel like I had anybody that I could connect with. Mm. So I, I just, and of course my parents said, oh yeah, you can do it. And I had, I did have some encouraging teachers, but I think that's a really powerful thing. And another way that I think it's powerful is I am not able to um, be able to do math with my students even today. So I tell my staff that I work with and the kids, do not ask me for help with math. I simply cannot do it. And I've had a wide variety of responses to that throughout the years. Mm-hmm. I've had people who just couldn't understand it. And I've also had one, some humorous responses. I was in a first grade class and I was trying to help students with math. 
And of course I got the answer wrong, even with, with a first grader. And the little girl couldn't understand it. She's like, why did you get this wrong? And I said, oh, Mrs. Diner just isn't good at math, honey. And she goes, there's grown-up school for that. And Bless. that just warmed my heart. And then there was another time I was working in a seventh grade class and somebody asked me, well, why can't you do math? And I said, God just didn't give me that ability to do that. And there was a girl in the class and she locked eyes with me and she goes, me too. And I'll just oh. never forget that moment that I had. Yeah. You just being open and vulnerable in itself and, and not hiding away or being nervous mm -hmm. about it, just embracing it for what it is, um, really opens up the eyes to those who are struggling in the darkness, like the little young Michelle. Um, I, um, I, I ran the, the people at the schools must be sick of me rambling on about the brain, but you brought it up <laughs> about the neural pathways being different and uh, wired different. And I always say to them, just in case, as I'm, I'm, I'm saying this now because you're here, I, I don't, obviously, I've not thought about it before. But in case I've got a little Michelle sat in my class, I, I do, I do talk about the neural pathways, and I've said, look, guys, we've got eight to six billion neural pathways in our heads. Every single one of our brains are wired differently. <laughs> Simple. Yeah. Right. Your brain is wired different to that person. You, we're all looking at the same thing, but you're all seeing it completely different. Exactly. Everybody sees that in such a different way. And I think yeah. our world needs different thinkers. Not everybody's designed to do the same job. If everybody yeah. was uh, great with numbers, then there there may not be that creativity that, that you see outside. And if everybody was really creative with things, then, well, there wouldn't be that order or that structure that we need. And That's I think right. it's learning to work together with our differences I can remember some of the best situations that at my job was when I worked with a teacher that was really in a staff that was really great with math and they were accepting of my disability and they said, okay, we'll handle the math. You handle the spelling and the reading for us. And whenever I didn't work with them for, for um, a year and I got maybe a different assignment, I would have the teacher say, oh, we were really lacking on spelling that year you're the one that would go in and make sure that our kids practice their spelling words. No, oh, that, that, that's filling the, the, that's filling your cup as well, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Because we work together. And I just think that that is a, is a really good example of nobody was expecting me to do math. Hmm. And nobody was expecting me to go in and uh, teach a lot of the things I couldn't do, but they did expect me to do what, what they struggled with a lot of them were they they just were not great at reading or writing and spelling and they we always tend to go for the things we're good at so they were helping with the things they were really good at and put an emphasis on that but i put an emphasis on something else and it just worked really beautiful together yeah, we should do that a little bit more, shouldn't we, for, for people mm -hmm. that we work with and staff and as leaders and embrace people's strengths and weaknesses. Um, obviously, encourage them to build, uh, create a safe space where we can go and build on the weaknesses, of course. And, and I know it's slightly different oh, yes. for, for you and Mass, but generally speaking now. and um, But also embrace the strengths. And, and, and as a leader, if you know something, if I'm your leader, your boss, I don't like to say boss, but your leader, um, if you've got a strength that I'm particularly going, I shouldn't be feeling secure i'm going to use you to help me so we can both benefit yeah. and, and build each other's capacities mm -hmm. but everyone seems to be scared of that everywhere i go and, and that's pretty much why i read, wrote how to lead with purpose with my co-author yeah. we we wanted the human side of leadership to show everybody's vulnerabilities be vulnerable yourself as a leader it's okay mm -hmm. right understand the mirror neurons in the brain of how somebody's reacting if that's possible understand people how they're feeling just bring that human side connection to the workplace and again on there's layers to it isn't there for teachers to, to the children you know the bosses to the teachers and then the, the departments yep. to the leaders mm -hmm. and then the the government to the department you know there's layers to all of this isn't there of course um let's talk you you said it intensified going into high school yes how did it intensify for you then Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.